The Bible says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Our own Lord intelligence of our own, these matters. You know what the verses are. You wrote the book, and you know what it says, and you know what it means. We look upon thee to give us wisdom and understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, all you have to do is just raise your hand and shoot. Go ahead. Um, uh, uh, all right. Kim That's Holden. the gap theory. All right, Kim Holman is in Pensacola, Florida. He lives uh, right across the church I pastored for 20, about 20 years, Brent Baptist Church. And Holman was a teacher at uh, Pensacola Christian College. And then he got a little bit too independent for him. And he's a smart fellow. Matter of fact, he's so smart he's going to wind up maximum security if he ain't careful. Because he's teaching this uh, no taxation and stuff that Greg Dixon teaches up in Indiana. What these fellows are teaching is uh, you have no right to uh, incorporate a church and you have no right to claim tax exemption because Christ, the head of the church, and the government isn't. And that's a tax rebellion. And uh, to fulfill that thing and really get that thing down right, you have to give up your marriage license, your hunting license, your car license. The idea behind that thing is as long as you're incorporated like a church is, you're the government runs you. Which is true, but that's Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> that's, I mean, see, somebody's getting a little bit late on the act. And the idea is that we have no business uh, uh, taking out Social Security or unemployment insurance or uh, workers' comp. That's the government job. If the church does it, then the government controls the church. And so the idea is to quit paying taxes. And Holman hasn't paid any taxes for about 20 years. And in order to get his driver's license, he gets hits one from Australia instead of here. And some other things. And right now, the, they've had him in court a couple of times, and so far he's survived, but he won't survive long. Uh, I have several of these running with these guys years and years back. They wind up in a big pen. The government is more worried about you not paying taxes than in killing people. You better believe it. And people, what people I get, they give me a hard time all the time. They, they, they write Ruckman, oh, you're such a bold, brave, blankety blank. How come you're paying taxes to the government? And how come you're incorporated? Why don't you do what our forefathers did? And our forefathers didn't want taxation without representation. Why don't you? And I write them back and I say, our forefathers, when they rebelled against taxation, got them rifles and began to kill folks. Are you ready? <laughs> And that shuts them up. They ain't ready. <laughs> now, that's the fella. Now, I don't say that to get rid of the evidence we're going to talk about, because I can brush that fly off like a mosquito. And he'd been trying for about two years to get a debate with me, and, of course, my kids in my school laugh. Now, I'll show you why they laugh. All right, take your Bible. Take your Bible. Now, here's the theory. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth, period. Now, the Schofield note will tell you rightly, and the Schofield isn't always right, but he's right here, that at that time something happened. And whatever happened, verse 2, has a messed up earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there be light. Then comes a recreation. Now, in your Bible, the way that thing is laid out is, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And doesn't say how long it took. It's not a word. You take uh, people in the school, they teach your kids, oh, you don't want to believe that old Bible. That old Bible said God made the earth in six days. No, I don't say that. Amen. Don't say that at all. It says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, look at it. Where do you find six days in there? They know six days in there. Just that he did it. All right, then he said the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. Then come six days and then the seven days where God recreates the earth and has the Sabbath of rest. But in here, something happened. Now we call this a gap. And what these fellows say is they say that isn't true. They say it's a lie. That's just a theory. The gap theory. It ain't no theory, it's a fact. Amen. And of course, the way you know it's a fact is from a passage that Tobman can't handle. Turn to Second Peter chapter 3. 
Henry Morris can't handle it either. These fellows have a time. Now, Henry Morris is a great creation research fellow out of California, and much of the work he turns out on evolution is real good. I use it. He's perhaps the greatest creationist that can justify creationism against evolution there is. And Henry Morris and the Creation Research Society out in California is responsible for the reinsertion of creationism being taught in some schools as a theory along with evolution, although not many schools have had enough guts to pick it up yet. <laughs> but he got a lot of influence. All right, now here's the problem with Henry Morris and Hoveman, and all of them. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3, uh, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, now we're in them, scoffers walking in their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Say, the Lord isn't coming back. I've been preaching the second coming of Christ for 54 years. I must be a liar. He ain't come back yet, has he? <laughs> Wouldn't you think I'd get tired of lying? <laughs> I've been saying he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he ain't come yet. They'll say, where's the promise of his coming? Don't bother me any. Don't bother me a bit. I'm expecting him to come today. Amen. Matter of fact, I'd be disappointed if he doesn't. <laughs> All right, you don't know I said for 120 years it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, going to rain. They said, you dumb old white horse preacher, what's your mind going to rain? <clears throat> don't you know the mist comes up from the earth and waters the ground? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, rain don't come down from upstairs, it comes up from the bottom. You need to go to college, Noah. <laughs> and then one day it came down. All right, here's chapter 3, verse 4. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers, watch it, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Genesis 1 1. They say there hasn't been anything here. It's been going on just like that ever since it was here. And that's the mark of a lost man doesn't believe the Bible. They don't begin, continue as they were from the beginning. Something after and after the beginning. Now, you know where they get in the mess here? The next verse. The next verse says, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that'll be Holman's case, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. They think that's Noah. Where'd you, where'd you find in Noah's day the heavens perished? Nothing happened to the heavens in Noah's day. The earth grounded. Never touched the heavens. But boy, something touched the heavens there. Yes, sir. Go back to Genesis 1. Now, I'm showing you the hard way to get the truth here. I'll show you the easy way in a minute. There's something much easier in the way we're doing, but it deals with a, a three-letter word. And Hoveman can't read three-letter words in English. I mean, the bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. I mean, it's these guys, the more educated they get, the more stupid they get for some reason. I don't know what it is. I never be able to figure it out. I, I've had as much education as any neurosurgeon you've got in the United States. Any of them. That death, 22 years out of 44 years, I've got five earned degrees and I've taught Hebrew and Greek. It just didn't take. <laughs> and these, these fellows went through it, took on them. North Carolina has the highest rate of, uh, has the poorest educational system in the United States, according to all the papers. So it's got the highest number of preachers. <laughs> now, did you know something? There's something significant about that. Why is there something about higher education that is against that book? Amen. And the less higher education you got, the more, the better preaching you got. Amen. And the higher the education in New England, the worse preaching you got. Something wrong. I mean, I cut my teeth down here, but not here, west of here. And when I first came down here, I was saved. But the big churches wouldn't have me. Man, coming to the background I came from, man, I was using cuss words in the pulpit two years after I was saved. <laughs> and and they, they wouldn't have me. But I got up here in the, in the mountains up here, and I learned something. I got back in there, and we're back in the hills. First meeting I have was out back there to go to Tryon, Columbus, or some place right near Brevard, went to Noah West back there. When I, where I preached there, I mean, you folks kind of tickle me, you see. You really do. You got these lights in here. I'm mean, you a high class boy. I, I go to the steakhouse. Steakhouse. You know, Target, you know, you kidding? 
Well, I came up here, there weren't any lights up in the mountains. They had Coleman lanterns, they had the kerosene lanterns, they had electricity. Nothing full of deep freeze, very deep freeze. Guy cut him a hole out on the side of the mountain, put his stuff under there in the ice in the winter to keep the stuff out, which is deep freeze. The, the churches I preach in, the ladies fed the babies in the church. They didn't have a nursery. They'd sit and feed the baby and had a blanket and lay him down there. That's, that's, I am back there moonshiners and quilters back in there in 1950. And I got back in there and I, I, I remember the first time I got back in there, I was out there praying outside that church and a bunch of teenagers went by and saw me praying. They, they, they made fun of me. They even tated a hog rooting. When they saw me praying out there, you know. First night in the meeting, they're throwing beer cans on top of the roof, you know, and laughing during church, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I picked up some kid going up the mountain, about 15 years old, and I said, uh, how are you, how you doing? And the boy said, okay, I said, are you saved? He said, sure, is it a hot day today, ain't it? I said, it's hotter than hell. Are you saved? He said, I saw a fellow get shot right back yonder about an hour ago, shot him dead. <laughs> I said, well, he's probably in hell. Are you saved? <laughs> I got some of that blood in me, too, you know. <laughs> and I said, are you saved? He said, that fella shot him dead. That one fella said, you's a liar. He said, ain't either. He says, it is so. And said, shot him dead. He said, they told me, boy, you tell him about, about this, we'll shoot you dead, too. And I said, well, if the sheriff probably got back here and by now and got him. And he said, no, the sheriff's scared to go back in there. <laughs> I got preached in that place. The old farmer said to me, he said, I'd have come the other night, Brother Upman, but I couldn't come. My goat got mighty sickly. It fell out of the field, and I had to nurse it. And I said, what? He said, my goat fell out of the field. I said, your goat fell out of the field? He said, yeah, my goat done fell out of the field. And I said, you mean it walked out and I fell out? And I couldn't understand until I saw that field. That goat fell, boy. <laughs> I mean, that, goat, that goat fell 50 feet before he hit the highway. <laughs> I saw a sign back there and said, uh, there ain't nothing in this woods worth you getting shot over. <laughs> and I got preaching there, and I mean, they got raised in hell in that church. They were laughing while I was preaching and shooting spitballs and stuff, and I got madder and madder. And I was, I mean, I've only been saved about a year. And I was, I was going, I, I was staying in the house, some old matriarch about 90 years old, way back in the mountains, no electricity in the house, and winter. And up there she had a room for me, had a table and a wash basin and a chair, and, and the bed was a bo uh, about two before. The bed was a box in the corner. And then I had a couple of eider down thrown in there and a straw pillow. You see your breath all night long. And I, she drive me back and forth to, to and from church. And I said to one night, I said, if those folks don't behave themselves, I'm going to start getting rough. And she said, well, you just do what the good Lord tells you to do, Brother Pete, you know. So I said, okay, and next night, Right while I was praying, they got laughing, messing around the back. And I just stopped middle of the press, said, you bunch of dumb thumps back there, you think you're so smart. I said, if you had dynamite for brains, you wouldn't have enough to blow the wax out of your ears. <laughs> and somebody down in front said, amen. <laughs> the first amen I had the whole meeting, man. <laughs> and I said, beside that, you're so crooked, you fell for a barrel of fish, you wouldn't get stuck. Amen. And we had four people saved that night. And going back home, I said, that old matriarch, I said, looks like we might have a meeting yet. <laughs> and she said, that's what does it, brother, prayer and plain talk. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the uneducated folks, see. The educated folks say all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Uh, the Bible just tells you that's a lie. Amen. They're willingly ignorant of something. What is it? That first heaven and earth was put under water. Amen. The heavens. That ain't Noah. Right, right. You walk back to Genesis 1, I'll show you why you know. That ain't no gap theory. Genesis 1, here's what they all overlook. Verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the what? Waters. There's the flood. And that on the earth, that's the face of the deep. Why, Job said the face of the deep is frozen. That sure ain't the Pacific and the Atlantic. <laughs> Amen. Plenty, well, we're not talking about a theory at all. That thing was drowned out in Genesis 1-1. 
That thing was drowned out. It affected the whole universe. Now, I don't have time to get into all this, but this, the picture of the universe in the Bible is that. It's a mountain. It's called Mount Zion. City up here. And the face of that thing is frozen. It's ice. And there's water here above the firmament, and there's water here below the firmament. And the firmament's in here. Now, that may not match Einstein, but that's because Einstein was a dingbat. He didn't know what he was doing. That dumb saphead, and I said that with charity, of course, that dumb saphead said he was a mathematician. And a mathematician could surely see that the odds in the Bible of 48 prophecies taking place on one man 400 years before he was born is a mathematical impossibility. But it's there. How come a mathematician missed that? That's called the laws of statistical probability. There's a gambler who makes his living to take odds better than 50 to 1. Not a one of them. So a horse race got 20 horses running, he knows 10 of them ain't going to make it. He ain't taking one out of 20, he's taking one out of 10. But out of 10, there are probably three of them that are almost sure bets. And of course, it's a banana race. If you got the thing fixed and bought the jockey off, you already know who's going to win anyway. A professional gambler don't take odds of one out of 50. Not a pro. Make you a living. You, their laws have to do with crap shooting and five card draw and seven card stud at Vegas. Better than that. The chances, brethren, of, of 48 prophecies coming to pass on one man given 400 years before he was born are one out of 10 with 147 zeros after it. And there isn't such a number. There are not that many electrons in the universe. If you had 20 million electrons on the end of your thumb, 20 million of them, that number would be so many that there are not that many electrons in the known universe. It's a number like this. One out of eight, and then 140 or 50 zeros after it. Let me show what the chances are. Suppose I said this. I said in, Kana- I said in, Kanapolis, Mer- in Kanapolis, North Carolina, a fellow going to be born in 1904 in January the 15th. And he grew up to be 40 years old, get killed in a trap accident in downtown Chicago at Newberry and 35th Street by a yellow cab, and his funeral will cost $31,345, and there'll be 300 people present at his funeral. What are the chances of that happening? That ain't even one out of that. That's about one out of about 900 trillion. And your book says there's going to be a man born who's going to be a shepherd, and he'll have some older brothers that don't like him, and they'll sell him for silver, and he'll have a, a coat dipped in blood, and so that one that comes up, well, his name will be Emmanuel. He'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll ride a coat in Jerusalem. He'll be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He'll have holes in his hands and holes in his feet when he dies. What are you doing, man? Amen. You can't do that. But that's what that book does. Amen. And Einstein was a mathematician. Ah, uh, nuts. <laughs> nuts. <laughs> Nutty as a pecan pie. <laughs> All right, now that's the thing right there. And the face of the deep is frozen. Now, there was a time when that thing was blacked out. It was water. And when it was blacked out like water, the devil and his crew were in that thing. And that's why the devil is called a sea monster or a leviathan in Job chapter 41. What you can't figure out in the seminary is easy if you've got a King James Bible. And then God made a firmament in the midst of this thing and opened this thing up. I don't have a piece of white chalk here show it. Uh, he made a firmament in the midst of this thing and divide the waters like that. The light's out here and the darkness is in here. And these things here, the, the sun, moon, and stars are lights to give light on earth in a dark place. Oh, now this thing was out like that. And then God said, let there be light out here Divide the light and the darkness there, firm it, divide water there, and then you go six days and six nights. Now, you know how you know that so? And how you know Hovman is just as nutty as a pecan pie? 
because when Adam shows up here, Genesis 2, make man God in our own image, made him out of the dust of the ground. When Adam shows up, he has three sons. And one of those boys is a type of Christ. And one of those boys is a type of Antichrist. And when he shows up, he shows up naked. And when he shows up, he uh, takes something orally that he shouldn't have taken, like that. And there's old Adam. When Noah shows up, Noah has three sons. One of them type of Christ, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. One type of Antichrist, or curse would be Canaan. The reason why he doesn't curse Ham is because in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, the Lord, the Lord blessed the sons of Noah. So when he cursed Ham, he didn't say curse would be Ham, he cursed his son. He'd already blessed Ham, he couldn't, re couldn't reverse the blessing. When he said curse would be Canaan, he, blessed, he cursed Ham's seed because Ham's sin had to do with his seed, sodomy. So he fixed up his seed. All right, that's Canaan sitting there. And by the way, uh, Noah's naked when that thing took place, and he was drunk, took something more he should have taken. Now look at that, my thing. When, when that flood shows up in Genesis 6, and Noah steps out of that ark at the end of Genesis 6, you know what God tells Noah? Just what he told Adam. Turn to it. Just what he told him. Genesis 9-1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Turn right back to Genesis 1, verse 28. And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. They're identical. Well, let me ask you something. If they're identical, was there a flood before Noah got out of that ark? Sure there was. Was there a flood before Adam showed up? You bet your boots there was. There's no theory to it. The book's laid out. Now that's the hard way to get the answer. I'll show you a much easier way. Go back to Genesis 1. Now, boys and girls, we're going to study here a little three letter worth what you learn in kindergarten. So put your thumb in your mouth and be sure you have your diapers changed before you get out of your crib. <laughs> Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and. Verse 3, and. Verse 4, and. Verse 5, and. Verse 6, and. Verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and. Verse 12, 13, 14, 15, and. Verse 16, 17, 18, 19, and, 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 and. Do you know what and means? It means and. <laughs> now look at that thing. You let me verse that chapter. There are 20, 31 cotton picking verse in that chapter that begin with and. Now you think some dumb fellow never got out of grade school could get that, wouldn't you? Show me one place where and refers to something that took place before the verse before it. There isn't a case. Five, and God called the light day, later, and God said, let there be, later, and God made the firmament, later, and God called the firmament, later, and God said, let the water, later, verse 10, and God called it, later, verse 11, and God said, later. Every and is something that happened after the one before it. Well, now go back and look at verse 1, 2. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and later, it is 31 times. How could verse 2 refer to verse 1? It couldn't, unless you're just as nutty as a fruitcake. These fellows are saying, why well, verse 2 is talking about the earth when God made it in verse 1, and nothing happened to it, because verse 2 is a description of what God did in verse 1. It can't be. You see why? And. A and D. 31 times God tells you when he says and, it is not a reference to the verse before it. Verse 2 could not refer to verse 1. Therefore, there's a gap. 
verse 1 takes place, and then verse 2. Got it? Well, okay. <laughs> but verse 2 got nothing to do with verse 1. You can't say, and God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darks upon the face of the deep, and God is not. And you can't do that. And verse 2. See verse 1? See verse 2? <laughs> and. The secret to Holloman's insanity is he can't read a one-syllable word in English. <laughs> All right, something else. Much of the book is like that, yes, sir. Uh, did you call me at all human cloning? On what? Human cloning. Human cloning. Yes. No, I don't think I could go on that. <laughs> if I was gonna if I was gonna get a Bible verse for it, I couldn't get a I couldn't get a genuine clone. All I could get you would be twins. That's all I could get you. And the reference would be on Adam and Eve who have twins, Cain and Abel and would be on uh, uh, Isaac, who has twins, Jacob and Esau. But that's just twins. That isn't cloning. I know what you mean by cloning. Uh, just settle one thing, Genesis 4, that, uh, that Adam and Eve uh, had uh, twins, and Cain and Abel are twins. Now get that, and then we'll talk about the other after that. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. One. And said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And, <laughs> obviously not at the same time. <laughs> and again, she bore, but there's no conception between. You see verse 1, she conceived and bore Cain, and she again bore. Then along comes Abel after Cain, but they're the same conception. See that thing? The twins. Now, one reason why you need to notice that is because a little bit later, Christ says, You're of your father, the devil, lest your father you will do. And John said, Not as Cain was of that wicked one. And Paul says, I don't want to have you be uh, deceived like the serpent beguile Eve, some other stuff in there. And we can't get into all that right now. But it seemed to indicate the devil had something to do with Cain's birth. But I've heard many a nurse, many a doctor tell me, and I've asked four or five of them just to double check, that identical twins can be born with different fathers. And they can be born as far as two and three and four weeks apart. So there's something going on there. Now, it's not a case of cloning. That's a case of twin. But in the case of cloning, the problem would come up from a scriptural standpoint. Since you have a body, soul, and a spirit, if you had a clone, would he have a body, soul, and a spirit? In terms of the soul is a thing that's you. And the, the, the scripture I'm giving you now is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where he says, I pray God your whole soul, body, and spirit be preserved blameless in our coming of Lord Jesus Christ, faithfully it cause you also will do it. Now, that's a man, a man made in God's image. God has a soul, God the Father. God has a body, Jesus Christ. God has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Son has heat rays. You can feel them but you can't see them. It has light rays. You can see them, but you can't feel them. It has actinic rays. You can't see them, and you can't feel them. That is, man's a trinity, and the sun is a picture of that trinity, and any man here is a trinity. You have a body, and there it is. Inside that body, you've got a spirit, the spirit of man, there it is, and you have a soul. Now, the thing is, you, when you talk about clones, there's only one part there. You could counterfeit the body. You could do that. You would counterfeit the spirit because all the spirits are the same. The Bible said, What man knoweth the things of the man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so knoweth no man the things of God, but the spirit of God. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Now what that means is there are four spirits in this world. If it's an unclean spirit, it's from Satan. If it's a clean spirit, it's from God, the Holy Spirit. If it's a human spirit, it's the spirit of a man. And if it's a beast spirit, it's an animal spirit. Which means all men have the same spirit. Every one of your spirits is identical. Uh, all animals, every, every, if it breathes, it's a, it's, a, it's a breathing animal, its spirit is the same as the other animal. That's what the spirit is, air, it's breath. Lord tells Ezekiel, come and uh, prophesy to the four winds, and say to the four winds, come, O four winds, and breathe upon these slain. And the Spirit entered them. Well, if that Spirit's like wind or air, so it's, it's not individual. 
That body is uh, flesh. Well, uh, flesh, you can, you, any, you, know, you can counterfeit flesh. That's, uh, twins are a good example. They're two different... One body's identical, and they're not, two, not the same fellow. Now, there's the problem. And in cloning, the problem that comes in, if you'd ever do make another human being out of a human being, has it got a soul? And the answer would be, from Scripture, it wouldn't. It'd be like Judas Iscariot. I've chosen you twelve, and one of you is a what? How about that? Did he have a body? Do you have a father? Sure did. Judas, the son of Simon. John chapter 6. He's born. I mean, shades of Rosemary's baby. <laughs> Did they get you ready for? I mean, there's a human being walking around that looks and walks and talks like a man and has the spirit of man, but it ain't a real man. Amen, brother. Yeah. I've, I've chosen you 12, and one of you is a devil, not the devil. A devil. Now the scholars have ways of getting better of that. I hate to keep bothering all this stuff, but, but you know, honest to God, if I could just quit reading, I'd be a decent fellow. I, I, mean, I mean, really, I'd be a gentleman if I just quit reading. The, the truth shall, uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you mad. <laughs> and, and the more I read, the madder I get. And the, my trouble is I can't put down books. I've been out so long now, I'm a, a book addict. I've read well over 23,000 books that I've read over, I've read one a day on an average since I was 10 years old. An average, not counting 150 times through the Bible. And the more you read and get this stuff, the more you're aware. See what's going on and you get madder and madder and madder. And the people you get mad at are the highly educated Christians. If, if, if I, I don't repent of what I'm going to say, and I'll say it at the judgment seat of Christ, and then if I'm wrong, God will slap my mouth shut, and that'll be that. But I, I have always thought the cause of all the uh, trouble America's in, including everything, the abortion and the evolution and the drug traffic and the sadism and masochism and foreign policy, the whole thing, if you want the source of it, I say the source is a Christian college. Yeah, that's right. That's what I say. I say that because of history. I've written two history books. If you went to my school, your textbook, I wrote the textbooks for it. And in two history books on history, what you find out is every, anything like communism, communism or atheism begins in a Christian school. Stalin is a ministerial student. So is Marx, so is Darwin. Greek Orthodox, Episcopalian, Christ College. They begin there. The Bible says judgment shall begin at the house of God. And the country, if you want to know what's no wrong with Canapolis, in Canapolis it's the families. Amen. If you know what's wrong with the families, what's wrong with them? It's the churches. Amen. If you know what's wrong with the churches, it's the preachers. Yeah. If you know what's wrong with the preachers, it's the bunch that trained them. Yeah. And I know who that bunch is. That's right. So I'm always on them. And I stay on them. Uh, I call myself the Lord's junkyard dog, see. That's what I call myself. Did you ever see a junkyard dog? They're not big. They don't, they don't, not many German shepherds and dachshunds, and, uh, not dachshunds, but uh, what do you call Dobermans, Great Danes. A junkyard dog, he's not a very big dog, but he won't wag his tail. And he'll look at you. <laughs> and he won't bark. Right away. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> oh, <what's that? laughs> and they're not thoroughbred. They're not thoroughbred. They're a mixed breed, you know, that bunch. And what God did, He took an old King James Bible and put that thing in a junkyard, got all through it. That's what they said. It's archaic. It's out of date. And they got these new ones. Put that old book in a junkyard and then put me in there. That's now listen, Ruckman. Uh, sit, sit up, speak, shake hand, lie down, roll over. <laughs> I'm the master, okay, yeah. You're my dog, right, yeah. Okay, do what I tell you to do, yes, sir. <laughs> I'll stay in this junkyard and watch this book for me. Amen, and if you see anybody come in here trying to use amen, that... Brother. You find anybody here coming to... Yeah. Trying to <laughs> amen, brother. You find anybody coming, I don't care who it is. 
I don't give a blankety blank who it is. I don't care if it's a fellow with an IQ of 250 went to Heidelberg to hell with his theology. And if he comes and mess that book, bite his britches off. That's what I've been doing for 54 years. I've been biting the britches off. Now to get off on that. Well, anyway, I, th- I, I think judgment begins the house of God. And I think that the seminaries and colleges would train the preachers to tell the truth, and they get in the pulpit and tell the truth, the families would start changing. And when the families start changing, the city would change, and then the county would change, and the state would change, and then you could reach Washington, then you get something done. But they're not, they're not going to do it. And the example I'm giving you, I'm, a, I'm just telling right now, they say, well, there are many demons, but there's just one devil. That's what all of them say. How many ever heard that? Let me see your hands. Bunch of crap. I've chosen you 12, and one of you is what? Devil. Say it again. Devil. Say it again. Devil. Didn't he say a devil? Yeah. There's more than one, ain't there? Amen. Why do they lie? Looks like so I, I mean, just if I could just quit thinking about it, I'd be just fine. <laughs> just can't quit thinking about it. You know, you know why I play hockey? The last game of hockey I played was last Saturday night. I played goalie. I played 600 games of hockey in the last... I got on ice when I was 60. <laughs> ice skates. I play on ice up in Detroit in the winter, and, and I play on rollerblades out in Boise, Idaho in the spring, and down home I play summer, winter, spring, and fall in the cement uh, in, a, in a gym. I'm a goalie. And you know why I do that? Because I have to have some kind of an outlet, and that's a good game to get rid of your, you know, your excess energy. <laughs> and you take that game right there, you have a chance, you know, to knock some guys around, trip them, and, and, and hook them. <laughs> they got a chance to beat you with a stick. And, and I, I, I need that, you see. Because if I didn't have it, I have no outlet, you know, to get rid of this stuff. I'd probably kill somebody. <laughs> And uh, it's, every guy's got to have some kind of an outlet like yeah. that. Amen. I wish you all could come down to Pensacola and just meet my people, not meet me, meet my people. I mean, I don't pastor a, a flock. I pastor a zoo, boy. <laughs> 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 I mean, I've got in there, I've got in there 300 men that are just ready to go. Amen. I mean, they're waiting for the word. Amen. And i gotta, I got to keep the lid on them all the time. Now, now, you know, no, not now, not yet, you know. It's a matter of time. You got to know when to when to take the stand. Those guys, one of them's a marine, retired marine, uh, gunny, three up and three down, uh, in Paris Island, you know, Lejeune, the whole works. And by once a year, he'll come there his blue dress uniform, stand right in front of me, in front of the desk, and say, "Good morning, sir." <laughs> I said, "Morning, sergeant." <laughs> Do anything for you, sir? No, no, thank you. Anybody you want to get rid of? No, 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 no. You know, I've got another guy in him is Ryman. He's up in, in Washington. He used to be a deal with a street gang and led by an iron worker, a whole bunch of, I mean, a roughneck man. And Ryman, he's he's about six feet and about 190 pounds, just skinny as a rail. I pull his wrist bone as big as my thigh bone. And he'll come by there, and he, he, he's one of these guys that smiles when he gets mad, you know. Did you ever, ever see one of them? And so one of them, the more the mad they get, the more they smile. They'll come by and say, Well, I said, Ruffman, I'm going up to, to Baltimore. I said, Well, good. He said, I'll be going through Greenville on the way up. I said, Well, fine. He said, You want to have me stop there and punch out Custer for you? I said, No, 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 no. I get this stuff all the time. So I got to get, I got to get in some kind of violence in order to get rid of this stuff. I've got two uppers and two lowers knocked out playing blood ball, these guys, when I was 50, and they were 15 and 20 in these pools. And uh, blood ball is a game where there's no referee and no timeout. It's a body contact sport, <laughs> and there's somebody got blood on them every time you finish. That's why they call it blood ball. And I never could resist that thing. I, I got to be 50 before I learned to put a rubber uh, mouth guard in my mouth, quit getting my teeth busted out. Well, that was too late for about four of them. 
But that stuff there is is they got to when you when you read this stuff you get madder and madder and madder. Yes. Yeah. Now they say there's one devil and many demons. Your Bible doesn't have the word demon in it. Amen. Your Bible says devils, 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 devils. The reason why it says that is because in the, those translators knew that all demons were satanic. A Greek philosopher taught that a demon was a genius and helped you out right. to be a bright fella. And your King James Bible got better sense. Now they're always messing that thing up, messing that thing up, messing that thing up. And that's what they've done here in this thing right here. They've told you a lie. And in cloning, if you're going to clone, you can't clone the soul because the soul is what we call the, the I am. In Greek it looks like that, ego. That's, you transliterate like this. What that thing means? I am. Christ says, before Abraham was, ego, I am. You can't counterfeit that. That thing is spiritual. So you might be able to clone them, but you've got something there that's it's inhuman. And boy, you talk about a vehicle for the devil. That would be one. Okay, something else. Yes, ma'am. If we're the bride of Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ is the husband, will there be a child? Will there be a child? <laughs> From that relationship? Uh, no, there won't be, but uh, there'll be children now from that relationship. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians 5. Get that in one hand. But we're talking about <clears throat> uh, Christ as the bridegroom and us as the bride. Then get Revelation on the other hand and get Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 21. Now, this is a problem. The thing she asks is pretty complicated because this matter of Christ and his bride is complicated. Matter of fact, it's so complicated in Ephesians, you're going to find it called a great mystery. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, and here's the similitude. Verse, 20, verse 30. 530. We are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. All right, I'm a member of Christ's body. I'm part of his flesh. I'm part of his bones. That's a marriage. That's where two people come together and become one flesh when the marriage is already over. What are you waiting for the marriage of the Lamb for when he's already married and you're his, brother, you're his wife and part of him? He says, join his wife and the two shall be one flesh. That's contact. Paul says this about the Christian body, shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid, know you not that he, he that joined to a heart is one flesh, for two or saith he shall be one flesh. That's on the marriage. Not sure this marriage divorce thing gets so thick, you see. These self-righteous preachers, they think a marriage is a ceremony. They're cockeyed. A marriage is where flesh joins flesh, which makes you wonder about the brethren sometimes. It's possible for you to have one marriage ring on your finger and be married six times. <laughs> think about that. <laughs> they don't want to think about that. Uh, Protestants have they have a they have a Catholic view of marriage. They think when you exchange the ring and say what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, is the marriage. That's the marriage ceremony. Yeah, amen. How could how, what do you? What do you think happens when a, when, a, when a saved woman marries an unsaved man? Do you think God joined them? He told you not to join them. <laughs> See that thing? That ain't when they're joined. They're joined in the bed. Amen. That woman, he says, uh, how, about, uh, how about you go call your husband? She ain't got any husband. He said, you told that you had five of them. The guy she's shacking up with now is somebody else's husband. <laughs> See that stuff? That thing, that thing, that flesh joining flesh, well, that thing is, is multiple, it's polygamy. You've got more than one wife. That's why the Bible says the bishop is to be the husband of one wife. He's not being going, you know, three and four at the same time. One. 
People say, well, you got a living wife or a living husband. Well, quit blaspheming God, okay? Hosea chapter 2, the Lord said about his wife, she is not my wife and I am not her husband. Now, you got that? You said the passage? Here, for college education. Hosea chapter 2, verse 1. God's bride is Israel. Christ's bride is the church. Now look what God has said about his beloved. Hosea 2.1, Say to your brethren Ami and to your sisters Ruma, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife. She was. She ain't no more. Neither am I her husband. There it is. Put her away. What for? Fornication. Once she's put away, she is not his wife. If she lives 30,000 years, she ain't his wife. And he ain't her husband. He's single. <laughs> Got it? Boy, the Christians have a time with it, don't they? I hear you cussing out God just because you're a Catholic. What a nonsense. Out of Ephesians chapter 5. Now you're one body with Christ. Now how can this be? Well, it can't be. Something's wrong here. We've got to get this mess straightened out. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 30. Members of the body, flesh, and his bones, one flesh. 32. Warning. This is a great mystery. It sure is. <laughs> you know what Paul says in 2 Corinthians? He says, I have espoused you to Christ as a chaste virgin. How could you be a chaste virgin and be part of Christ and part of you? Great mystery. You bet your life's a great mystery. Now, let me, uh, let me show you what I mean here. Now, how many of you fellows here this morning, your wife is not in this room right now? Raise your hand. All right, the Bible says you're one flesh. Now, you stop and think about that. Isn't kind of stupid? <laughs> I mean, she's off five miles from here. How can you be one with her? You're sitting over here. You ain't no Siamese twin. Now, you take you guys that are married here with your wives. Isn't she sitting next to you? I don't see an umbilical cord between you. <laughs> Joining you together. That's why he calls it a great mystery. It's when flesh joins flesh, they become one flesh, but they're still two different bodies. Now, Paul said, I've espoused you. That's an engagement. You're engaged to Christ. So the marriage of the Lamb is coming. Revelation chapter 19, her bride hath made herself ready. To her with grand, she should be clothed in fine linen, for fine, all that stuff, see? Psalm 45, the marriage of the Lamb. Revelation 19, marriage of the Lamb. The marriage is coming up, so right now you as a body of Christ are a virgin. You haven't joined anybody's flesh. The book says you're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and one body, and one is part of his arm, one is part of his eyes, 1 Corinthians 12, somebody's part of the foot. Explain it. Tough question. <laughs> you know, uh, among the things I've got at home, I've got a 205 painting in the book of Revelation I did, and that's now available for a pastor if he wants it. It's available as a, uh, as a VCR with sound and everything else you want it. And that thing is all classical music and scripture for two and a half hours with over 200 paintings in it. Now, during those paintings, I'm painting this and that and other thing, and I, when I'm painting that thing, I'm, I'm, the thing that takes up most of my time in painting is showing what took place between uh, the crucifixion of Christ and the second advent, including everything. Most, most of the pictures deal with the Armageddon and the marriage of the Lamb, for some reason. And I'll tell you, if anything happens there in the studio where you get painting those things, when you get painting those things, you come to this thing we're talking about. You try to paint that marriage of Christ, how are you going to paint it? How many of you fellows are saved right now? Let me see your hands. You may have. Uh, is Christ in you? In you. Is Christ in you? Or is he in me? Is he in you? That's ridiculous. There has to be four of them. See that thing? Four, is Christ divided? One over here, one over here, one over here? See that kind of thing? Do you get thinking about these things? Boy, they get deep, man. They get heavy. You take it, now let me ask you something else. How many of you men love Jesus Christ? Let me see your hands. Were you a faggot or something? <laughs> See, 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 see? Um, people in America have forgotten how to think. You don't think. Your mind just goes, hoo, 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 like this. 
how could 12 million men be in love with one man? And those 12 million women, men together form a woman, his bride. Fuku, fuku, fuku. That's why he said it's a great mystery. But when I get painting those pictures, I'll tell you what happens. I'll paint a picture. The only way you can paint it is a woman marrying a man. That's what it says. So I have Christ standing there, you know, and he's. Arms outstretched, here comes this beautiful woman down the aisle with a King James Bible in her arm. I got that in there. I messed him up on that. And then I've got a picture there where he's putting a ring on her finger over the King James Bible. That upsets him so bad they just can't stand it. <laughs> but when you get painting that woman, and then you, I paint a moon on her up here and a, and a sun up here. I mean, who is she that shines forth, clears the sun, fares the moon, terrible on with banners? You take that woman, I use a model to paint that thing with, a Hollywood model, you know, dressed in a wedding gown, and clean up her face a little bit so she looks like a Christian. <laughs> and and, and when, you get, when you get painting that thing right there, you get, goose, you get goosebumps for some reason. I don't know why. But boy, you paint that thing and then show that thing on the screen, 8 by 8 screen, with classical music behind it. You pull that woman of that beautiful woman in that wedding gown standing there across her forehead it says Ecclesia. That means church. And then behind that you got Honnold's uh, 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 the conch heading of the conquering hero and a hymn in a, a choral group that's singing. You hear it in the background quietly, it gets louder and louder. It goes dum 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 Da 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 Boy, you put that thing up there and it'll make your hair stand on them. And you say, why? I don't know why. I just know the only way you can draw the marriage is a man and a woman. That's what I draw. But you put that thing back there and I mean it'll curdle your blood. I put that thing on down there, and I've seen a guy, a gray-headed, gray-suited businessman who never said amen. I've seen him around the front row stand up on the seat, and he shrieked so loud you couldn't hear how to hear the speaker. I wasn't, I wasn't thought about that. And I got part of it. I got part figured out. But you see, you see, you have to think. <laughs> And nobody thinks these days. Just turn on the boob tube and blah, 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 blah. You got to think. You folks up in North Carolina, you still in good as you used to be, but you still got a chance to think. That places in North Carolina, a guy can go and hear himself think. <laughs> but you'll never do it downtown Concord or Kannapolis. Okay? You get thinking, you get run over. And I get thinking about these things, and I, I've come to conclusion. That's a pretty carnal conclusion. But when the, when the Lord wanted the prodigal son to come home, he got him hungry. That's your belly. And his motive for coming home was get a meal. Isn't that a pretty carnal motive? <laughs> he's got a handout. And then invite people to come to the, the wedding, come to the wedding feast. That's your belly again. And sex. Isn't that something? How God used those two things to appeal to a man? Sex and food. And I got thinking about that, and the more I think about it, the more I'm sure of what I'm getting ready to say. Uh, I can't, I can't, I'll see you in a minute, I'll get the rest of the question for you, which I'm not too sure about, but I'm sure what I'm getting ready to say. Everything down here that feels good, and I'm talking about any fleshy experience, any fleshy emotion, any time, any high you got off drugs or low you got off of ecstasy or some other piece of junk. I don't care what it is, heroin, crack, or red devils, blue jackets, or yellow submarines. I don't care what you've been messing with. Every good, thrilling feeling you ever got down here out of anything is a fallen, depraved counterfeit of something that's real up there. Just sure as I'm standing here, it's a fallen, it's an adamic thing. And the, wait, where'd you get it there? Amen. 
Listen, you get to be just like Jesus Christ. You know what that's going to be like? That's going to be, going to be like getting plugged in a 220-volt circuit and just spinning on the high <laughs> like that. And, uh, amen, brother. And it ain't going to come down. It ain't going to come down. What do you think all that a rapture for? That sudden catching up like that? It's called a rapture. As sure as you live and breathe, everything down here is, is, is like that is a fallen counterpart. All right, now, two things. He said, you're engaged with a chaste virgin, which means full contact has not yet been made. And that is, you're a part of him, which means full contact has been made. That's that thing is, the spiritual contact has been made, but the physical hasn't. In plain of words, in plain of words as, far as, as far as being part of Christ, Listen, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So I'm part of his body, spiritual body. Part of his bone, spiritual bone. Part of his flesh, spiritual flesh. In that sense, I'm looking forward to the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage hasn't, take, the marriage hasn't been consummated. That's why in the Old Testament, the guy, is, the girl he's engaged to, is called his wife before he marries her. That's why God said to Joseph, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Yes. And they are not man and wife. So the bodies are gone. Now, see, you're getting it ground here. You say, well, then what actually happens, uh, I, can't, I can't describe that. I don't know what a word is going to happen. I know what it's going to be like, but I can't get my finger on it. I couldn't, couldn't explain it to you. It's a great mystery. All right, now I'm about this marriage consummated. Revelation chapter 21, and I'll show you why I said about the children. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. We're not only married to a man, we're married to a city. And the city is a, the city and the, what's here is, is involved here is a city is a picture of the Lamb's wife. That's us. Verse 9, There came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and said, Come hither, I will show thee the bride. That's us. The lamb's wife. That's us. And he carried me away, and he showed him a woman. No, sir. He showed him holy Jerusalem, descending out of God from heaven. A city. Ain't there something? <laughs> That Bible says you Christians are lively stones, living stones. That city comes down has to be an organism. The cotton picking thing has to be made out of live stones. It's like every brick in that street, Golden Street, and everything in that wall, everything in that building, those mansions, are composed of living organisms. It's like God is building the city right now. And every time a soul gets saved, in goes a brick. Amen. And when it gets completed, come up hither and off you go. Now you say, how in the world can a city be a living woman? I haven't got an idea in this world. But I know what they're doing on TV. They're getting you uh, terminators and exterminators. They're made out of inorganic material. Gold and metal and electronics, and they're going around with human beings. Now, one of them, they got one of them, I think he melts into a liquid. And then the liquid turns into something else, and all that. See, I mean, if you want to find out what's going on, always get your dime store Bible before you get you anything. <laughs> or now, about these things, hear what Paul says about the Christian. He says in Galatians, Jerusalem, which is from above, is the mother of us all. She has children. Turn to Galatians. She's a mother who has children. And we're the children. Now those dumb Catholics think Mary's our mother. That's because they're stupid. Or right, Galatians chapter... Like I say, if I could just quit reading, I could be decent. And the last thing I said wasn't nice at all. And I wouldn't have said it except I was a Catholic before I was saved. And they told me if I had Christ my Savior, I'd have to have Mary for my mother. And the priest told me everybody who has Mary for their mother is my son. Time to play hockey. 
All right, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Verse uh, 25. For this Agar, that's an Egyptian from Ham, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, Arafat, Muhammad. Arabia. And answers to Jerusalem, which now is the Jew out of fellowship with God, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above Revelation 21, is free, underline it, which is the mother of us all. Now you're told New Jerusalem is the Lamb's wife, and that's you. So that relationship bears children. But it bears children now. See? Now after the marriage is consummated, then no more children. After the marriage is consummated, that's honeymoon out on earth, you know, in the millennium, and then into the Father's house forever in Revelation 22, and no more children after that. There are children then, but then the children born then, the children of God born then, are born in the flesh. And that'll get into something else, too. Well, let's most better stop there. <laughs> okay, something else. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I can't hear it quite. Could you? Uh, could? You know, in Jesuit, that the concubine is killed, but it comes with the man is a husband. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite getting this yet. I, I tell you, I can hear the, the, the sound of your voice, but I'm getting the word to sing out. Uh, would you somebody give me to that? How about, excuse me, sir, would you tell me what she's saying? What she said? What she asked you? Oh, yeah, okay, all right. I got that. All right, wife and a concubine, uh, back in the Old Testament, we'll get uh, Genesis, and we'll take Abraham's case. And uh, Abraham's case will be, oh, Genesis 20, 25, get that in one hand, and then come to the list of uh, people in the Old Testament in Chronicles. And uh, I think we'll take uh, Chronicles, oh, yeah, Chronicles 1. Uh, First Chronicles, First Chronicles 1 and, Ge and Genesis 25. All right, now this is, uh, this is Muhammad's situation. The Koran says every Muslim in America can have four wives. Uh, the Koran does a little better than that. The Koran uh, doesn't limit the number of wives, but it says that uh, in addition to them, he can have all those slaves that belong to him. <laughs> Uh, the Koran teaches slavery and harems. And so Muhammad, when he captured a country, they'd take the women and they'd sell the kids into slavery, and then they'd take all the, your wives and your daughters and put them in the harem. And they weren't regular wives. They were just uh, people you shack up and you felt like it, and you could have them. Uh, uh, Muhammad had 14 wives. He left nine widows. One of the wives he married was a nine-year-old girl named Aisha, and she was 12 years old when he went to bed with her. And that's the role model of every Muslim in America. They'll try to pull your leg. They'll try to tell you, well, it isn't the right, but the average Muslim not like that. These dead. No, no, you're just as wrong as you can be. Amen. I've been through that. I've been that Koran 16 times. I got thing, that thing marked up like a Bible. When that fellow died, he left nine widows, and he married his own daughter-in-law. And Deuteronomy and Leviticus said if a married fellow uh, uncovers the niggas his daughter in law, you're to kill him. That's Muhammad. Amen. And it doesn't matter. But a Muslim, you know why a Muslim behaves himself over here? Because he do not dare do otherwise. That's what all Catholics do till they get a hold of the country. That's what all Muslims do. They're all crooked. All of them. Some of them are nice folks, persons. So don't get upset. I mean, hang on to your britches. <laughs> uh, some of them are nice folks, personally. There are a lot of good black folks. I know some black folks much better Christian than white folks. A lot of them. So when I talk, I'm never talking about hate or hating anybody. I'm talking about protecting yourself or watch your step or you'll get shot. That's what I'm talking about. Um, you take the colored folk, there's a lot of them good folks. Down, uh, especially down south, up north, they're kind of a different kind of colored folks up there. But that's because they gave them too much rope. You take down home, uh, that woman worked for me for 23 years. She was the finest Christian woman I've ever met in my life. She's not work any white woman in the world. I'd come back 
some many time I'm pretty careless with money, leave it lying around. I've come back many times and find dollar bills and stuff spell on my bed. She took out of my pants before she took them to the laundry. She wouldn't have steal a dime. I remember one time I was late catching a plane. I got to the airport in five minutes. I looked and found the ticket was gone. And I phoned back home to Evelyn. She's working there and got a lost my ticket. She was law me, Dr. Robin, I find it. She hung up. And that woman in five minutes found that ticket, went out in front of the house, flagged down a car, got in the car, drove to the airport, and I got that ticket 45 seconds before that gate closed. Uh, so you, as individuals, you find fine Catholics and fine Muslims and fine black folks, but you better watch your step because God has said certain things about those groups and they'll behave themselves as long as the, the bridle's on, take it off, and boy, you'll have hell on wheels. It's a tragedy, really. Gary, Indiana. Now, 13,000 white people left that place in 30 days. Up north. The whole town moved out. 13,000. Three times white women going through that town were stopped and raped. And when I was taken to court, a couple times, a mother with three kids and no man with her, the, they had black witnesses to prove that she propositioned them as a whore. And all three of them were decent white married women with wives and families. And the white folks, that's enough of that, and they left Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana is bankrupt. They try to get gambling there to get you to come back in there. Nobody's going to go back in there. Every time you get a good kind of fellow, a woman who loves the Lord, and there are a bunch of them, then their race does something that absolutely stinks. You say, just, I know, Joe Clark, that, that, that black uh, 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 high school principal up in New York, that fellow carried a ball bat around with him and banged him with it. And he'd take those little rascals in there and sit them down and say, let me tell you something, nigger. You got... <laughs> you got two strikes against you. In the first place, you're black, and that's a strike against you. And you're poor, and that's a strike against you. Don't get a third one. Behave yourself. They fired him. Yeah, they fired him. He turned out a respectable citizen. That's why they fired him. And just about time, I'd, I'd make that guy president, man. You take a holly field. I saw him go into the ring. He never even looked at the crowd. He, He's praying. The whole time he's going down. I saw him. He's praying. Put his hand up in the middle of the ring. He's standing there going, the guy's praying. I don't know very many white men do that. Yeah. And then just about the time you begin to have some confidence, then some dumb jackass like Tyson bites the guy's ear. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get back to this in a minute, but i got to say well, I mean, I had a, we've got the only segregated school in America, I guess you know that, 37 years, and every year it's a sweat. We have to pray our way through, God deliver us 37 times, but we had nothing else. This is our school, a, it's, a, it's a Caucasian school, but only by the grace of God, been a miracle man, that thing started in, in 1965, and we had a thing like this. Fella comes to us, he's from Toledo, Ohio, he's a black man. Say, fella, you got all my tapes. He can play the violin and play the piano. He's obviously very intelligent. He wants to come to school. I say, well, I guess you know we have to take you. And you do. Government close you down if you don't. And I said, uh, if we so you couldn't come, they have the FBI out here, the, the police, and I said, we got to take you. He said, well, I don't want to cause any trouble. I don't want to go around you wanted. And I said, well, I said, I appreciate your taking it that way. I said, uh, you got a civil right, though. You don't attend the school, don't you? He said, yeah, I know that. I said, don't we have a civil right to charge you? He said, yeah, you have that. I said, tell you, I'll make a deal with you. I said, since you're every end decent fellow and straight, I tell you, I'll do. If you give up your civil right to get in this campus, I'll give up my civil right to charge you, and we'll teach you the whole three years for nothing. Private tutoring. And for two years, we taught that guy in his own home, and I'd get off at 10 o'clock at night and go down the nigger section and teach him there with his black wife, and then two or three other teachers take turns. We took him for almost two years. 
That guy made A's and B's in all the courses. He made B's in Greek and Hebrew. I thought to myself, boy, we got us something here. We got us a black, independent, King James, Bible-believing, premillennial Baptist. And I was just, boy, flying high about it, man. And then he began to quit shaving every other day. Then he began to miss meetings in the house. I'd go down there at night at 10 o'clock and wait for him. He wouldn't show up. His wife wouldn't know where he was. Finally, I told her, I can't keep coming down here. I got a family, too, teaching at night. I said, if he can't make it, we're going to have to drop him. He showed up a couple of more nights. And the last night he showed up, I was teaching him Genesis. And we got right in the middle of Genesis, and he stops and says, uh, well, do you suppose today there will be three races that match them, three temptation, what you talking about? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you teach the three temptation to Christ. You said he was the same as uh, what you found in First John and Eve, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. I said, yeah. He said, do you suppose that it goes to the three races too? And I never thought about it. I said, well, yeah. I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, I think that pride of life, he said, I think that's shame. That Job and them Jews are self-righteous. That's that pride of life that Oriental. So I think that the lust of the eyes, so that's Japheth. He wants to run the world, look what he sees, and get everything he look at. So I think that lust of the flesh, that's our problem. Let's see you find that at the seminary. And then, boy, I mean, about two weeks later, I quit going. And two weeks later, he dropped all the courses. And two weeks later, he was within three months of graduating. I drive downtown my uh, van, and of course in the van you can see down, see up, up high, you can see down. I'm looking down at the traffic, and here comes a car pulled alongside me. The guy hadn't seen me up the driver, and it's this fellow. His name is uh, 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 Perry, Linnell Perry. And he's sitting there, and he's got a little old 13 or 14 year old color boy sitting beside him. He's messing with that boy. And I got guy got messed with kids. Blew it. Gone. Now, one year down there, we, we gave him a school where we charged him a dollar an hour and paid for the rent for the building and paid for the blackboard and paid for the books and paid for the teachers and charged him a dollar an hour. And when we opened, there were nine preachers. In the middle of the term, there were five preachers. And at the end of the year, there were three preachers. And the next year, they didn't even come. I thought, a lot of demons, and I've come to the conclusion there's something wrong with that race. And I can't imagine an individual. It's the race. It's like Noah said. And you get dealing with groups like that, Catholics and Muslims. There's something bad wrong with the Catholic Church and the Muslim Church. Bad. And it may have good individuals in it. That don't mean a thing. That means they'll blow you high in a kite. That Catholic Church killed more than five million Christians in the Dark Ages, Amen. plus Muslims. And the Muslims are killing them right now while I'm standing here. They're killing Christians right now in Angola, and the Sudan, and Indonesia, and the Philippines, and in India, right now. And you say, well, if you can't blame all of them, then how come you never hear the leaders say anything? Amen. You folks got internet and web, do you? Tell me the last time you saw a Muslim sheik, or a caliph, or a hajif, or a ulama, or an imam, those are Bible teachers, their Koran teachers. When did you hear one of them even criticize Arafat or bin Laden? You didn't hear them do it. You know why? They believe in killing you when they get a chance. That's why. <laughs> All right, now about this Old Testament. Old uh, Muhammad said, get your concubines and get your wives. He had 14 of them. Now, why did God let them do it? All right, so let's get uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, Chronicles 1, verse 32, on Abraham's children. Now, the sons of Keturah, Abraham's concubine, see that thing? Not said to be his wife. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Midian, 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 and Ishbak, and Shua, and the sons of Jokash were so forth and so forth and so on. Now, those are concubines. <clears throat> now, uh, 
concubine is a, is a second-class wife. And uh, in the Old Testament, they said to Jesus, they said, well, if, if uh, getting married to more than one woman is wrong, how come Moses allowed it? And he said, Moses allowed it because of the hardness of your heart. But in the beginning, it was not so. Where Genesis 2 with Adam and Eve, in the beginning, it was one. And God allowed it in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's definitely counseled against. Well, each man have his own wife, and each wife her own husband. What for? To avoid fornication, so you don't mess with somebody else's wife and husband. Now, when he says the bishop should be a husband of one wife, he means one. You're true to her, not five or six more like Muhammad. So there's no such thing as legitimately being married to two, three, four, five women. No, at, not at the same time. Now, you see, when he says one wife, I got a guy in Tennessee Temple one time. I got him good, man. I'm glad I did. Please give me this one wife stuff. Well, you don't qualify. You don't have a living. You, you've got two living wives and all this junk. At that time, I was pastor in Brent. And right at that time, Horton was next door trying to get the church. And Horton at that time was a fair-haired boy from Bob Jones. He'd been there just like I'd been there. And he was in fellowship with Bob Jones. They wanted the property. So Bob Jones was putting pressure on me to get me out so Horton could have this, my church. Now things are, uh, Horton's turned against him and accused him of heresy, and <laughs> they're all shot to pieces, which is nothing to me. But anyway, they got that thing going, and Bob Jones Jr. wrote me a letter, and he said, you need to resign in the Brent Baptist Church. I said, why? He said, you're not married. You don't qualify. The bishop be the husband of one wife. He said, you're single. I wrote back and said, okay, I'll get married, and I'll qualify. And he wrote back and said, no, then you'd have two wives. I said, myself, I said to myself, man, ain't that weird? Here's a president emeritus of a Christian college of 4,000 students, and the jackass thinks that one in zero is two. <laughs> have you ever noticed how much trouble these fellows have with one syllable of the words? You know, one and one for the worst time. I had to meet one time in a school down in Alabama, a church down in Alabama, Birmingham. About the time I started down there, some guy at Mid-South, a professor. I have a magic influence on college professors for some reason. And he phoned to the pastor of the church and said, I hear you're having Ruckman in for a meeting. He said, yeah, we have them in every year. So I didn't know you had adulterers in your pulpit. He said, yeah, I do. We have them in regularly. <laughs> 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 and, and, and he said, well, why is that? And the pastor says, well, I'm an adulterer. And he said, you are. So I know you've been married more than once. He said, I haven't been. So why do you say that? And he said, well, you know, the Bible said, whoever looks upon a woman, the lust trap in his heart, hath already come Click. Amen. What's my there, Professor? You having a little trouble with that Bible, are you? The trouble ain't with Ruckman. It's that Bible. That's your problem. This guy from Tennessee said, well, you don't qualify your husband of more than one wife. I said, no, no. I've got one wife, and I'm true to her. And he said, yeah, but you've been married twice. I said, it doesn't say let him be married once. said to be the husband of one wife. It doesn't say married. And he said, it means the same thing. I said, do you believe that? And he said, yeah. I said, you don't believe that. He said, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. He said, you call me a liar? I said, I sure am going to prove it in about five seconds. Now, one more time, buddy. Do you really believe that if a man has been married more than once? Now, don't lie to me. Tell me the truth. Do you believe if a man been married more than once, he disqualified as a pastor? He said, yes. I said, then he kicked Bob Jones Sr. out of the pulpit. He got married more than once. And get rid of Adoniram Judson. He got married more than once. And get rid of Monk Parker. He married more than once. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but their wives died. I said, don't back it out now, chick little. Don't back out now. You didn't say one thing or about anybody dying. You said if they're married more than once, they didn't qualify. Yeah, but if, yeah, but if you're foot. That woman in Romans chapter 7 never got divorced. Did you ever read your Bible? Try it someday. She never got divorced. The van she had was a husband who was still her husband. 
And that's why she was called an adulteress, because she was stepping out on him. Rock a bye, baby, on the tree top. <laughs> I never forget one time, right after I went through one of these debacles, I was out there in California up in the redwood trees, Sequoia National Forest, with a bunch of Bible Baptist fellowship fellows. And we were all sitting around a big table there eating, and suddenly there was kind of a hush over there, like, you know, quiet wind for a hurricane, low for the storm. I knew something was coming. I don't know what, and I was sitting there. I had, I had my kid with, kidding me with at the time. I took him out to California and back with no mama. The youngest was a year and a half. I was throwing disposable diapers out the window all the way over and back, going out to California. <laughs> and I was proving that I was a better raiser of my kids than my wife was. And I proved it. But I was out there with those kids by myself, and about that time I felt the table looks at me and he says, you think a divorced man should preach? I mean, you know, 20 pastors sitting there at the table that was. Got just quiet as a turkey farm on Thanksgiving afternoon. <laughs> And I said, uh, Lord, give me something crack. I said, what'd you say? <laughs> and I didn't say, what'd you say to this lady here? I could hear a voice, but I couldn't get the distinction of the word. But sometimes I'll say, what do you say to gain time to pray? <laughs> I haven't known to do that when I didn't know the <laughs> answer. <laughs> and so this guy says, I said, what'd you say? I said, Lord, give me something, give me something quick. I'm in a mess, God, help me out, Lord. And he repeats the question. I said, well, look at it this way. I said, uh, suppose you and your wife don't get along. And you know, you, you never know what you're going to put your foot into. Because when I said that, his, his, he turned beet red in the face, and his wife ducked her head and began to eat her food <laughs> very industriously. <laughs> I said, well, what you do, man? But I said, uh, suppose you knew I don't get along. I said, uh, uh, and she leaves you. Are you going to go on preaching? And he said, well, uh, well I guess uh, I don't know. I said, did God call you to preach? He said, yes. I said, God call your wife to preach? He said, no. I said, you can't quit because she quits, can you? Amen. He said, well, I never thought about that. I said, well, think about it. Please pass the soul. <laughs> I took care of that one. Now, the New Testament definitely counsels one marriage. Well, I believe that. I don't even believe in divorce. I think a man and woman been married 50 years, I think that's great. I think that's the way it's all to be. I think every marriage ought to be that way. I don't counsel divorce anybody comes to me. They come to me about five times a year. Now, I'm obligated to give them the grounds of divorce, which I do. I know the grounds for divorce, and I give them the grounds. And if they want to use that's their business. It ain't mine. But I don't counsel. Of what I've heard from divorce, the only person that profits from it is the lawyers. The kids don't get nothing out of it. And eventually your wife or husband won't either. It'll be a mess. I think the best thing is get married and stay married. Yes, sir. I'd have come to my church and married for 65 years. Amen. I think that's beautiful. Amen. I ought to give that guy the Congressional Medal of Honor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what that 65 years, that must be a plutonium or uranium anniversary or something or other. Oh, now in the Old Testament, they let them have uh, second-class wives. Now, Keturah, come back to Genesis and watch Keturah. Genesis 25, verse 1. Sarah's dead. Genesis 25, 1. But Abraham had two wives while Sarah was alive. Sarah and Hagar. 25, 1. Again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. That's the one that was called a concubine in Chronicles. And she bore him Zimram. There they go again. Now, watch 6. And of the sons of the concubines, plural, which Abraham had, he had two of them. One of them was Keturah, and one of them was Hagar. Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward in the east country. Well, there goes Ishmael. He sent out eastward, Saudi Arabia. No descendant of Ishmael has any business in Palestine. It ain't his land. Well, let's take this concubine Hagar, come back and see where she appears from, and get uh, Genesis, and get Genesis chapter, oh, Genesis chapter 16. When Abraham went down into uh, Egypt, he had Sarah. When he got back from Egypt, he had an Egyptian from Ham. 
Hagar. When Lot went down in Egypt, he didn't have any wife. Because you read in Revelation chapter 11, or Genesis 11 and 12, that when Abraham went out of uh, Ur of the Chaldees with Haran with his Lot, he went out with Lot, and so on and so on, and Lot has no wife. But boy, when Solomon and Moore get burnt, here's old Lot with a wife. Well, if when, when Abraham comes up out of Egypt, he got a wife with him, then Lot got one too. All right, look at uh, chapter 16. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Now where did he get, he get that Egyptian from? All right, go back and look at chapter 12. Genesis 12. Genesis 12, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn. And up he comes. Chapter 13. Abraham went up out of Egypt and took his wife and all he had and a lot with him. Now he's got him another woman. All right. Pay, uh, chapter 16, verse 2. Now Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go down to my maid. It may be I may bear, obtain children by her. We say by proxy. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah, and Sarah's, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to husband Abraham, and he gets a child. All right, he gets a child, and what happens to this child? Well, come over here and pick up a chapter... 20, verse 9. This is the Egyptian. This is the concubine. Genesis 21, 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, mocking. Wherefore she said, Abraham, cast out this bond woman. A servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. <laughs> cast out this bond woman and her son, for the son of the bond woman shall not be here with my son Isaac. Oh, out he goes. God says, cast him out, and out he goes. Now, you know why that's so important? Muhammad claimed to be the 70th descendant of Ishmael. And the Koran says, Abraham didn't offer up Isaac on the altar. He offered up Ishmael. Right. Type of Christ. That's a devil's book. It says that the best type of Christ you have in the Old Testament is Ishmael. He's a born woman that got kicked out of Palestine by the one who begat him. All right, now what's this fellow going to be like? Well, he, he tells you what this fellow's going to be like. Uh, verse 21, he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt, an Egyptian wife from Ham. That's Ishmael. Arafat, brethren, is not a Palestinian. He's an Egyptian. His wife is not a Muslim. She's a Catholic. Why hadn't he killed her? She's an idolater. Aren't Muslims big on one God and no idols? What you that Catholic life, boy? Be a Dolorosa. Hail Mary, full of grace. <laughs> Blessed be the fruit of the loom, all that stuff. <laughs> well, I come back to Genesis. Let's see about this boy. Genesis uh, chapter Ishmael, chapter 16. Chapter 16, 11. This Ishmael, the Egyptian boy. Thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael. Twelve. He will be a wild man. <laughs> There's your role model. His hand will be against every man. There's your Arabian. That's him. And every man's hand against him. You know why the Arabians and Muslims haven't driven Israel clean back into the water by now? Because they can't get together. They're all against each other. Iraq and Iran fought against each other for 15 years. Syria and Egypt been banging away, blowing each other's brains out for 30 years. That's Ishmael. That's your Muslim. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. 
the descendants of Ishmael all dwell there right together. Now with the Jews. And they're brethren with the Jews through Isaac. But Isaac is the chosen seed. Another concubine. This is a second-hand wife. And uh, Solomon had a thousand wise princes and concubines. Come to 1 Kings. And get 1 Kings in one hand, and I'll show you what David did with his. 